Zoids is one of those series that has been around for a long time, decades even, and despite some nice memories of seeing the show as a kid, well, I have to admit I don't really know much about the property. When I put it into a viewer poll against other shows that viewers have mentioned, I honestly was a little surprised that Zoids was such a favorite. To me, the show was nothing more than something that came on before Dragon Ball Z at like 6am before school, but it seems that a lot of people out there have fond memories of this show and its sequels. While I am happy to report that after watching the first 34 episodes of Zoids, I can say that the adoration is absolutely well placed. Zoids actually got its start as a line of biomechanical inspired model kits manufactured by the company Tomy. The funny thing about the models is they actually started out under the brand name Mecha Bionica back in 1982. But the models failed to capture the imagination of Japanese children, and they were dropped fairly quickly. However, making models is kind of a commitment and a big pain in the ass, what with having to make individual molds for all the different pieces. So, in order to get some money back for their investment, Tomy licensed Mecha Bionica out to the United States and Europe under the name Zoids. And this new line of models got so popular in the West that Tomy went, oh shit, and they just reintroduced the line back to Japan under the new name. Zoids continued to be popular in Japan, Europe, the US, and even landed a Radio Shack exclusivity deal at one point. Hey, back in the 80s, that was a big goddamn deal. They stayed popular for about 15 years until a manga was released named Kaiju Shinseki Zoido, and that is the work upon which Zoid's Chaotic Century would be based. Did you like how white I pronounced that? The animation was done by Studio Zebek, who we've covered before as they did the Broken Blade TV series, and I'm sure we'll cover them in the future because their catalog is incredibly extensive. It began in 1999 and lasted for 67 episodes, eventually spinning off into multiple sequels. Zoids would be split into two separate series in the West, Chaotic Century and Guardian Force, due to a time skip that lands clearly in the middle. This is perfect for this channel, so we will be talking about Zoids Chaotic Century today, which covers the first 34 episodes of the anime, and we'll cover Guardian Force in a few weeks. Also, while I did watch the subtitled version of the show, I'm going to be using the dub versions of the names for the characters because in some instances they're just a lot easier to say. For instance, I'll be calling Fine Fiona, and I'll be calling Sieg Zeke, uh, just a heads up. So with introductions out of the way, let's sit back and take a look at the adventure of Von Flyheit in Zoid's Chaotic Century. Chaotic Century's adventure takes place on the planet Z, a world that humans are not native to, but I'll tell you what is, giant mecha dinosaurs. Unlike a lot of other mecha anime, Zoid's titular robots aren't built by engineers or scientists. No, they're actually the native inhabitants of the planet and are actually living machines of war. Zoids are actually semi-sentient and can be encountered in the wild, but at the time of the series this has become more and more rare, as the Gylos Empire and the Helic Republic are at war. Both sides have captured all the wild Zoids that they can to build up their forces, and this has left the desert continent a place rife with bandits, booby-trapped ruins, and roving bands of soldiers from both sides. So when Vaughn, a youth from the village known as Wind Colony, sets out to explore some nearby ruins, it's no surprise that he is immediately chased by a group of bandits. These bandits pilot the show's first Zoids, a big scorpion called a Gysack, and are known as the Desert Arcobaleno Gang, which is quite the intricate name right off the bat. Firstly, I gotta say I was a little surprised that this show's tone is decidedly more adult than I at first thought it would be. 
It does target children and younger teens, but it also actually allows characters to die, uh, drink alcohol in the latter half of the first season, and more characters use guns more regularly. Hell, the first time we see Vaughn, he's being shot at by a guy sack for no reason other than they think it would be good target practice. So while when I was going into Zoids at first I thought I would be watching something that was really close in tone to like Pokemon, this show has way more to offer than just being a distraction for children. However, you wouldn't really know that if you watched the dub. Zoid's Chaotic Century got a very similar treatment to shows like One Piece when it came to censorship and localization, and the dub cuts a ton of scenes from the show to make it a little less violent. Most references to alcohol and smoking were also cut, so at the end of the day, the subbed version of the show is definitely the way to go, unless you're just in it for that early 2000s dub nostalgia. That being said, the sub is really great and the Japanese voice cast does a really good job, especially Vaughn who's played by Daisuke Kishio. Kishio really gives a great performance here and the range of Vaughn's voice is honestly really impressive, which is doubly impressive seeing as how this was one of Kishio's first roles as a main character. Vaughn runs from the bandits that I mentioned, eventually taking shelter in some old sun-baked ruins. Inside, Vaughn finds a strange egg-looking mechanical pod that opens upon his approach. Inside that is a small T-Rex-like Zoid named Zeke, and while I say he's small, I mean that in reference to other Zoids because he's pretty big compared to a human. Vaughn, who's been searching for a partner Zoid so that he can emulate his father, is immediately taken with the metal dinosaur and goes full I love you and I'll walk you and I'll feed you and love you forever mode, and even naming him the same name that his father gave his Zoid. And I can see why, honestly, what kid wouldn't want a robot T-Rex as a pet? That's awesome. I actually really love Zeke as well. He's more like a big dog than a dinosaur, always getting into mischief and communicating in artificial sounding grunts. He's a good boy. Zeke and Vaughn make it outside the ruins where it is revealed that Zeke has the special ability to combine with normal Zoids and increase their power exponentially. He can also do this with Zoids that have been destroyed, as illustrated by his first choice to jump into an old shield liger. Gotta mention the design of this thing, it's great. Uh, the Shield Liger really won me over uh, with the Zoid designs, and it's known to be the poster boy of the Helic Republic, and one of their fastest Zoids. Pretty lucky for Vaughn to just nab an A-rank mecha right off the bat, but then again, he is the mecha anime protagonist, so that tracks. He drives the bandits off in the Liger, and then Zeke leads him back into the ruins where they find another pod. However, instead of containing another Zoid, it contains a young girl. Unfortunately, she has absolutely no memory, she doesn't even remember her own name. Vaughn, being the optimist, decides to name her Fiona, and takes her and Zeke back to his home village of Wind Colony. Pretty much as soon as they get back, the desert bandits attack once again, demanding that Vaughn hands over Zeke, calling the little guy an organoid, which we will later learn is a special and rare type of Zoid. They end up taking Vaughn's sister Maria hostage, and after Vaughn saves everyone, he decides that he and Fiona need to leave Wind Colony and explore the world so that they don't put everyone at risk. This second episode is pretty fun, though Rosso and Viola harassing the town to capture Zeke didn't really do much to dispel my fears that this show would be similar in tone to Pokemon. Don't get me wrong, I love Pokemon, and uh, I'm very nostalgic for the first few seasons, but you just gotta take shows that are made for 10 year olds as they are, you know? Uh, so I was pretty much ready for Zoid's Chaotic Century to be an enjoyable, if not kitty adventure with low stakes and a lot of whimsy. That thought was extinguished when the town priest reveals that he's packing heat and is totally willing to shoot Rosso in the head if it comes down to it. That actually surprised me. I mean, Pokemon has guns in it sometimes, but Zoids would go on to be something a little bit more adult and thoughtful. Not long after Vaughn and Fiona leave Wind Colony, they come upon our third main character, the eyepatch-wearing, command-wolf-piloting mercenary Irvine. 
You can be forgiven for thinking that he is the antagonist of the week at first, because he spends the first third or so of the series determined to steal Zeke from Vaughn, who he deems unworthy to be using an organoid. They find this old fortress from 50 years before the series started, and it's guarded by a zoid known as a Gordos that's waiting for its old master to return. Inside, Fiona finds a strange pillar in these ruins with mysterious writing on it, and it gives her a vague memory and causes her to pass out. Now Vaughn and Fiona at least have a goal in mind. Find out about something called Zoid Eve. As the two continue their adventure, they meet a transporter named Moonbay. On top of running goods and services throughout the wasteland of Planet Z's continent via her snail-like Gustav, she's also an accomplished Zoid mechanic. She's also shown to be pretty unscrupulous when it comes to taking work and is always out to make more money, which becomes a problem fairly quickly for the group when they're attacked by Republic droids because she's hauling Imperial cargo. Also, she knows Irvine pretty well, as he sort of filters in and out of the group for a while, always taking an opportunity to swipe Zeke if it arises. Luckily, these Republic droids are sleepers, basically guard droids left on autopilot, so they're pretty easy to lure into a giant explosion caused by the aforementioned Imperial ammo. Though they're safe for the moment, Moonbay demands that Vaughn and the Shield Liger act as her bodyguards for a while to pay her back for detonating her cargo. And so the group of Vaughn, Zeke, Fiona, Moonbay, and sometimes Irvine is assembled for their adventure throughout the wastes. We finally meet an actual character from one of the two big factions when a troop of Republic soldiers led by Captain Rob Herman shows up. At first, he accuses Vaughn of stealing the Shield Liger from the Republic. They get thrown in jail at a nearby base, and in a weird coincidence, Irvine is also there for trying to steal ammo from the military. Wow, ballsy. Luckily, Irvine has some explosive in his boot and is able to break himself and Vaughn out of the brig. They run from the base in their zoids, eventually having to work together to take out Rob's flying Terra. This is the first time that Irvine seems to be impressed with Vaughn, but it takes a while for that sentiment to grow as he continues to be pretty antagonistic towards him. Having characters develop over the length of the entire show is something that Zoids actually really excels at. The guys rush back to the base to save Moonbay and Fiona, only to find that the ever-resourceful transporter has worked things out in her own way, but that has locked them into taking a contract for the Republic. The Empire is massing troops nearby, and Herman's plan includes having the Gustav haul some explosives to a nearby bridge to blow it up so the Empire cannot cross. While they do that, Irvine and Vaughn are to act as fighters for the Republic side. Of course, things don't really go to plan, and Vaughn has to run off to help detonate the explosives because the detonator won't work. Vaughn and Irvine have to display some teamwork again, but they successfully blow up the bridge and complete their mission for Rob, driving the Imperial troops back, at least for the moment. More important than the engagement in this episode is the fact that we are introduced to some Imperial characters to get the real core of the conflict going. First is Major Schwartz, who is shown to be level-headed, not really agreeing to the plan of attacking the Republic. His underling, Marcus, goes over his head, devising a plan with their superior and the series' major antagonist, General Preutzen. And if you couldn't tell that he was evil, well, uh, he looks like Sephiroth. During the standoff in this episode, we see that Rosso, the leader of the Desert Bandits from earlier on, is given an order by Preutzen to attack their own troops in order to end the standoff. Oh, by the way, it turns out that Rosso and Viola are actually disgraced Imperial soldiers trying to get back into the military by pleasing Preutzen, but it backfires pretty quick. Rosso has all the blame for the failed attack laid upon him, and then once Vaughn and Zeke defeat his Redhorn in combat, he's taken into custody by Imperial troops. Rosso, Viola, and the whole Desert Gang uh, play a way larger role in this show than I thought they would, and they even end up taking a turn later on that I just didn't see coming. 
Rob Herman thanks the group for their good work, telling Vaughn that he should head to the Republic capital of New Helix City to research Zoid Eve at the Archaeological Research Center there, even giving Vaughn a letter of recommendation. The trek to the capital takes quite a long time, about a third of the season if you look at episode count. Personally, I like a good adventure anime, so that's all good with me, and Zoids fills this travel arc with the introduction of new, important characters and great interactions with old ones. Even when something in the show feels like it might be filler, like taking a pit stop to help a crazy old scientist make artificial snow, it definitely isn't, because that crazy old scientist will turn out to be someone named Dr. D, one of the Republic's greatest scientific minds and a super important recurring character. Right after D is introduced, we're finally shown the world's most mysterious character, a black-haired boy named Raven who is revealed to be traveling with a black organoid. Raven works as a foil to Vaughn in his journey, being a rival to the growing Zoids pilot and also a tool that the Empire uses to cause trouble all throughout the series. The biggest difference between the two Zoid pilots is that Vaughn sees himself Zeke and the Liger as partners, while Raven uses his organoid Shadow as a tool. Later on, he's willing to destroy his own Saber Tiger because he loses a fight in it, and there are multiple instances of him saying that he outright hates Zoids and people that are weak, you know, that normal antagonist stuff. Much to Vaughn's disappointment, Raven is a much better pilot than him and wins their first few engagements with very little effort. Even when Irvine and Vaughn both fight Raven at the same time, they're only able to land a few hits on his Zoid. Once he calls on Shadow to combine with the Saber Tiger, he easily takes both of them out, which badly damages Zeke, causing him to fall into a coma. Of course, Vaughn blames himself for his friend getting hurt, and this is where he realizes that in order to protect Zeke and Fiona, he needs to become a much better pilot. In a sort of surprising turn, it's actually Irvine who holds a big grudge against Raven, working with a Republic officer named Colonel Kruger to equip his Command Wolf with a state-of-the-art missile system to give him an edge. Unfortunately, not even this brand new weapon system gives Irvine enough power to take down Raven and Shadow, resulting in another loss for our protagonists. During these scuffles with Raven, the group is near a Republic base called Fort Kronos. The Imperials stage a huge assault on the base, and we see that Schwartz keeps telling Marcus to pull his forces back and not to underestimate the Republic. This ends up being good advice, as we see Kruger is willing to blow up the whole base to drive the Imperials away. Then there's an episode where Dr. D shows up and tells Vaughn to go climb into a volcano to retrieve something called Zoe Magnite to feed Zeke to heal him. It is a deus ex machina if I've ever seen one, but the episode is pretty fun, and it's a good break from the Zoid battles. With Zeke healed, the group heads on towards the Republic capital, which is finally within reach. Unfortunately for them, the Imperials have also continued their march despite their huge losses at Fort Kronos. This time they attack the Republic capital's defensive line at Mount Osso which is where the Republic unveils their secret weapon called the ZG, which is really a big T-Rex-style Zoid called the Gojulus. I really love the Gojulus design, it just screams Godzilla, and out of all the Zoids in the show, I think this is the one I actually want a model of, and the cool ones are $350. Also, I love how they don't even reveal the full Golgulus at first, keeping it in a container that looks like half construction scaffold and half cage, like the thing is so powerful that they need to keep it constricted. When they finally unleash it, the Gojulus repels the invading Imperials by itself. This episode finally feels like Vaughn and Irvine have become friends as Vaughn saves them from a fatal fall. I like how Irvine is treated as a second main character during this arc, wanting to pilot the Gojulus to discover his true potential. Of course, he doesn't get to pilot it, that job is left to Captain Herman, but Irvine keeps his drive to become stronger until the end of the series. Finally, the group arrives in New Helix City, which is throwing a parade for the recent military victory. You would think that our heroes would like a nice respite from all of the travel and from getting caught up in that whole war thing, but Vaughn decides to meddle once again. He ends up saving an Imperial soldier from getting a beating in an alleyway. This guy escaped from prison, but Vaughn doesn't believe he should face mob justice just for that. They get chased by Republic soldiers who think Vaughn is working for the Empire after that and are saved by a man wearing a frog mask, 
who of course happens to be Dr. D. He takes them to the archaeological research building through the sewer and then literally blows a hole through the floor with explosives saying that it's fine because he gives them permission. I guess being the top scientific mind of the Republic really has some perks. They find a bunch of old artifacts and it's a little interesting that there are actual dinosaur bones in the building. I don't know if any of the future Zoids shows goes into the history of the planet or are even in this timeline, but that's a neat little detail. Among the artifacts is a stone tablet written in ancient Zoidian, and it mentions a people called the Garil that used to live at the Garil Plateau within the Imperial borders. This sets up the next leg of our journey, as Vaughn and Fiona decide they want to head to the Garil Plateau themselves to look for clues about Zoid Eve. But before they can do that, a giant iceberg appears and is headed towards the city. This giant iceberg is revealed to be a secret submarine type ship thing commanded by Preutzen to attack the city, but at the same time Imperial forces mount a second attack on Mount Osa. Vaughn and Irvine have to go retrieve Rob Herman after his Terra is shot down, and when Raven shows back up, Vaughn is able to hold his own under Rob's instruction. This illustrates to Vaughn how much experience can count for in a Zoid battle, and they end up defeating Raven as he rams his Saber Tiger into Vaughn's shield, completely destroying it. It's no skin off Raven's nose, though. He says that his Saber Tiger deserved to die for making him lose. They end up blowing up Mount Osa base, which forces the Imperials there to withdraw, and the President of the Republic, who happens to be Herman's mom, by the way, contacts Preutzen to demand that he end the attack. Preutzen seems like he'll just keep attacking, but in a twist of fate, Emperor Zeppelin croaks right then and there, which leaves his young and kind-hearted grandson Rudolf in line for the throne. Rudolf immediately takes action, as he never agreed with his grandfather's war in the first place, and announces a total ceasefire and end to the war between the Republic and Empire. This is wonderful news for Vaughn and co, as they need to travel through Imperial territory to get to Gareel. The music that plays at the end of this episode is really cool, and I wanted to take a second to say that the music in this show overall fits the tone and setting, but it's also just great. A lot of the tracks incorporate chords from acoustic guitars, very fitting for the near-constant desert theme of the show. We learn that not only is Preutzen a high-ranking general in the Imperial military, he's also a Lord Regent of the Imperial Throne, supposedly helping Rudolf rule until he comes of age. But being the megalomaniacal freak that he is, Preutzen meets with a guy named Metalnik, who he hires to assassinate Prince Rudolf before the coronation. That way Preutzen can blame the hit on the Republic and restart the war, and he as Lord Regent will take the throne for himself because there's no clear heir. Pretty good plan if I do say so myself, and uh, welcome to Game of Thrones with Big Metal Tigers. At the same time, the Desert Arco Beleno gang breaks their leader Rosso out of prison. Rosso, who was originally causing all this trouble in the hope of getting back in with the Imperial military, now decides that they're going to intercept Prince Rudolph while he travels from his country estate to the Imperial capital for the coronation and hold him for ransom. These two groups collide in a battle where people are actually just shooting guns at each other, which kind of stands out in this show. Yeah, the tone gets decidedly more adult once we're past the 20th episode. Luckily for Rudolph, he ends up with the lesser of two evils, being saved by Rosso's gang and held hostage in the wilds. While Rosso and Viola have pretty much just been villains at this point, it's here where we see a more human side to them. Rosso talks about not caring what happens to Rudolph, but when the prince is cowering and holding on to Rosso for dear life during the middle of a gunfight, well, the red-haired bandit can't really help but feel bad for him because he's literally like a child. Now, Preutzen is not only trying to have Rudolph assassinated, he's also having Raven roam about, ambushing Imperial patrols and collecting their Zoids cores. The Zoid core is basically the giant mecha's heart. Without one, a Zoid can't repair itself, and for some ominous reason, Preutzen is having Raven collect them to perform an experiment. 
Vaughn's group makes it to the Gareel ruins in relatively no time flat. After an entire arc of travel to the Republic capital, I was a little surprised to see time pass so fast, but the war is currently over and their travel was relatively uneventful, I suppose. Vaughn ends up having to destroy a bunch of sleepers, but this time it's a group of Imperial Red Raptors that he ends up taking out. This displays how much better Vaughn has gotten as a pilot, where earlier on they would have had to flee the ruins, now he and the Liger can mop them up no problem. Inside the ruins, Fiona finds another stone tablet piece that gives her more recovered memories of something called the Death Soarer, an ancient Zoid of great destruction. While the group is no closer to finding the meaning of Zoid Eve, they now have a new goal of discovering the meaning behind Fiona's hidden memory. Vaughn kicks a small rock in frustration, and it flies into a bush and hits a hiding Rudolph. Rudolph has been traveling with Rosso and Viola since the Metalnik incident, and at that point he seems to trust them for the most part. I mean, they did save his life, but he wandered away from camp to get water and got lost. Raven is given the task of hunting down and killing Rudolph for Preutzen, and when he comes across the Imperial Air hanging out with Vaughn, he revels in the chance to kill them both. Raven is piloting the brand new Genosaurer, a Zoid created through the process of altering Zoid cores, and this thing is so powerful that it damages the Shield Liger with its main cannon just by firing near it. Rosso and Viola intervene and try to stop Raven, but the Genosaurer is just too powerful, and Rosso entrusts Rudolph's safety to Vaughn before he and Viola are enveloped in a giant explosion. I really liked how they brought the early characters back, and Rosso passing the torch to Vaughn, a pilot he recognizes as someone who has become strong enough to defeat his gang, was a really nice touch. Rudolph travels with Vaughn's group for a time, since they have no more leads on Zoid Eve for the moment. He tells them he needs to return to the Imperial capital, but doesn't go into detail on how he's the heir to the throne, though Moonbay figures it out pretty quick after she sees his noble signet ring. Rudolph asks Vaughn to teach him to pilot a Zoid so he can stand up for what's right, and it's pretty neat to see Vaughn become a mentor for another character. Ever since that initial loss to Raven, Vaughn has been maturing into a wiser and stronger person. And while he still has his moments of childishness, Vaughn's character growth throughout Zoids is pretty well done, and it never really seems forced. His changes of opinion all come from the events he's put through, like Zeke being injured or saving the fleeing Imperial prisoner and facing the consequences. Raven is sent to capture Rudolph, using Shadow to quickly swoop in and nab him. Uh, man, having wings is kinda OP, actually. A group of Imperial troops then attack them, as Preutzen has framed them as the ones responsible for destroying all the search parties looking for Rudolph. During their escape, Vaughn is forced into a fight against Raven and his Genosaurer, but this time he takes a direct hit. The Shield Liger's core is damaged, and it shuts down and spits out Zeke. Vaughn needs time to himself, so he runs off, leaving Zeke and Fiona there. Metalnik now has possession of Rudolph, but apparently they really need that signet ring to prove it's him, and we get the reveal that Vaughn is actually in possession of it. He heads to save Rudolph from the assassin and is surprisingly successful. This episode barely uses any Zoids for the conflict, and while that's rare in this show, I gotta say it's usually a really nice way to break up the formula. Plus, Vaughn needing to prove to himself that he can save someone on his own without Zeke or the big metal Liger is a great character moment. Speaking of Zeke and the Liger, back at camp, Fiona hears a mysterious voice in her head, and she climbs inside of Zeke, and they both combine into the Liger. A huge cocoon of light envelops the Zoid, and inside, Fiona is faced with a serene field of flowers, but also another her. When Vaughn and Rudolph return, Dr. D comes out of the bubble in a weird suit and tells them that he believes Zeke and Fiona are trying to repair the damaged Liger core. Vaughn actually gets really upset at this, as he believes Zeke left him behind and that they promised to always do everything together. I mean, it's not like you didn't just leave him at camp to rescue Rudolph, but okay. Just another piece of growing up that Vaughn has to do before the series' conclusion. 
Metal Nick ends up working with a sadistic hitman named Stinger to take the ring from Vaughn's group. And this guy's really crazy. He ties up Fiona and Moonbay so they'll die a slow death from exposure to the sun. And now I wonder how much of Stinger was changed in the dub, but I'm not watching that to check. Right before Vaughn is about to be killed by Stinger Zoid, his new Liger appears and it easily takes the hitman out. This new Zoid is quite sleek and has two huge blades as well as being able to produce its iconic shield. Dr. D says that sometimes organoids can cause a Zoid to evolve, and the shield Liger should now be called the Blade Liger. I do really like that they give us an immediate demonstration of how much more powerful the Blade Liger is, uh, as Stinger's munitions just bounce right off its armor. Vaughn demands the Imperial Signet ring from Stinger, but he reveals that Metal Nick has already taken it and it run off. Rudolph says it's fine, he can now return to the Imperial Capital with pride because for the first time he has made true friends. While Fiona was inside the Cocoon of Light, she recovered some of her memories and tells Dr. D that she's actually an ancient Zoidian that was placed in stasis to escape the destruction of her people. Her real name is L.C. Lynette, and while she has recovered some of her past, the true reason for being locked away eludes her. Uh, she also decides not to share this with Vaughn for the time being. And then a little bit later on, we learn that uh, the ancient Zoidians used to, like, store memories inside of organoids and that's kind of what the other her was when she melded with zeke inside the liger uh, it's not super explained in this first half of zoids but it makes enough sense where you don't have to question it too much so now the group heads directly for the imperial capital with rudolph who plans to meet with prime minister homolef to discuss defeating Preutzen. Homolef is someone that Rudolph says they can trust, so the group goes along with it. Before they can make it to the city, we get two episodes that give us a bit of backstory on Irvine and Moonbay, and it's here where I actually realize that despite spending almost all of the show with them, we really don't know much about their pasts. Irvine's episode is pretty simple. They come across a town who is suffering from bandit attacks, and recently the bandits stole medicine that the church desperately needs. Irvine offers to help for free, and Vaughn really wonders why, because Irvine never does anything for free, and then we see that through flashbacks, his younger sister died when he was a child from a similar illness. It's not exactly the most complicated backstory, but it adds an extra layer to Irvine, and it helps to explain his drive to better himself. Plus, any episode where Vaughn and Irvine have to come up with a plan together and then struggle to execute it is a favorite, and also an extra point to Zoids for having the balls to just, like, show a child die in a flashback. That's... that... I did not expect that one. Second, we get a glimpse into Moonbay's previous life, when the group comes upon a lavish estate while fleeing from Imperial soldiers. The master of the estate is a merchant named McMahon, who just happens to be Moonbay's former lover. The episode goes on as Vaughn tries to figure out why Moonbay would leave the lavish life of the estate to be a nomadic courier, and when he sees her indulge in one night of lamenting what may have been, he decides the group should leave without her. He lets McMahon in on a secret, but in a twist, the playboy tells Moonbay about it so she can resume her adventure because he would never want her to stay with him unless it was her first choice. Moonbay rejoins the group and laughs off Vaughn's naivety, and Vaughn learns that sometimes the easy path isn't the most fulfilling. All in all, a really good episode that I quite enjoyed. At first, I thought they were going to have McMahon be like the stereotypical, like, evil ex-boyfriend that was gonna plot to keep Moonbay there, but no, he's actually just a chill dude. In fact, he even defends them from the Empire. And in turn, seeing the reason why Moonbay didn't want to stay with him not be something really shallow, it adds a lot of depth to her character. And I know I didn't talk about Moonbay much, but I actually really, really like her in this show. One thing I don't really enjoy about the end section of Chaotic Century is the reintroduction of Rosso and Viola as a pair of masked pilots that help Vaughn's crew to atone for their past actions. Rosso and Viola sacrificing themselves in that huge explosion to save Rudolph was a really great character moment for everyone. 
everyone involved, and they atoned for their antagonistic ways, Rudolph realized the stakes of his fight against Preutzen, and the cost that it might entail. So when the two show up with masks and Rosso calling himself Alo Barone and grabbing some new Zoids called Storm Sorters to help out the main characters, it just falls pretty flat. For one, they receive their incredibly powerful new Zoids from Dr. D and the Republic, which doesn't really make much sense. Rosso was an Imperial soldier and he's had no interactions with any of the Republic characters, so why would they just trust him with these prototype Zoids? We also don't find out how they escaped the giant explosion either, and this show doesn't have any other huge leaps of logic like that, so it really stands out as some weird writing. On top of it not making much sense within the flow of the story, they also just use Alaborone as the ultimate deus ex machina. Like, they just show up at the end of episodes to blow up someone trying to stop Vaughn, and while it's sort of funny and comes out of nowhere at first, it does get old the third time that they do that. When our heroes finally approach the Imperial capital, they aren't shocked to find that they're surrounded by the Imperial army. However, the soldiers are commanded by Prime Minister Homolev who Rudolph is overjoyed to see. They spirit Rudolph, Vaughn, and the others to Holmolef's estate, and Vaughn is told that he'll receive an Imperial Medal of Honor and full citizenship for his efforts to return Rudolph, which he's not really interested in and kind of rude to Irvine and Moonbay. I mean, they're also there. <laughs> the Gustav has done most of the heavy lifting in this entire series. Homolef tells Vaughn that Preutzen has been leading the Imperial search for Zoid Eve, though he doesn't really know what it actually is. While Vaughn wants to go to Preutzen's lab right away, which has been built upon some ruins up north, Homolef asks him to wait until Rudolph can be placed in power. Vaughn just can't wait for that, so he sneaks out at night to go find the lab, being caught by Irvine and Fiona along the way. Fiona goes with him and they end up running directly into Preutzen, who gives an evil speech and says he knew Vaughn's father, Dan, who was a major in the Republic forces. Fiona gets captured, but Vaughn saves her, and then we see the Death Sorer, Preutzen's ultimate weapon, starts breaking out of containment. It breaks its way out of the base and shoots a big laser that Vaughn says is way more powerful than the Geno Sorer, and then it powers down. Meanwhile, a commander named Hardin leads an assault on Homolef's estate, planning to execute them for conspiring to install a Rudolph imposter on the throne. Yeah, because they don't have the signet ring, the people loyal to Preutzen believe Rudolph is a body double that Homolef conjured up from somewhere. I don't know why they wouldn't be able to make a fake ring if that was really what they were doing, but that's just a nitpick. And these guys are super evil, so they don't need much justification for executing a child, I guess. Vaughn and Fiona decide to rush back to Rudolph after seeing the destructive power of the Death Sorer, only to find their path blocked by Raven and Shadow. This fight is rather brief, as Vaughn realizes he can't beat the Genosaur currently and decides to just run away and regroup with the others. Raven won't let him leave and starts stomping the Blade Liger until Fiona flies out of the cockpit. Vaughn realizes he can't run from this fight, and with the power of friendship, he's able to engage the Genosaur in a battle where he uses his swords and shield at the same time. Eventually, Fiona fuses with Zeke so they can both jump into the Liger, so a ghost Fiona can appear in the cockpit and kiss Vaughn, telling him that the strength to beat Raven has always been within him, and that Zeke and the Liger are just responding to it. Finally, Vaughn is able to destroy the Genosaur, and I gotta say, I really enjoyed this fight. It's probably the most dynamic out of all the battles in the show, and it's a great watch. So finally, Preutzen is giving a big speech at Rudolph's funeral, where he plans to take full power, but when a bunch of Republic forces led by Rob Herman show up, who, by the way, were called by Homolef, which does kind of make it look like he's betraying the Empire, and I'm surprised they didn't go into that as like an extra thing Preutzen would accuse him of, the Death Sorer comes out of a big hole under the main stage. That's kind of morbid to build your giant death mech under the stage where you're you're holding a funeral, but all right. Preutzen starts blowing up the whole city, and we get a revelation that this entire time, Preutzen was being controlled by the Death Sorer itself, which has an unquenchable thirst for destruction. 
Rudolph shows up personally and tells Preutzen to stop, but he's like, nah, fuck you, I'm the Emperor now, and he starts blowing up his own troops. Then Preutzen tells Vaughn that he was the one who killed Vaughn's father for disobeying orders on a mission, and that mission was to recover the Organoid Shadow, which is a cool idea that I wish they delved into a little bit more here. So they realize that they have to destroy the Death Sorer, and the only way to do that is to render its particle gun useless by destroying the big intake fan on its back, because why not have a giant Death Star style weak point? Through everyone's effort, the fan is ruined, but then it turns back on right as Vaughn is rushing the giant monster, but then Vaughn literally cuts the particle beam with his sword, revealing that he can coat the blades in energy now, and it's really cool. <laughs> And he does a Goku-style blast through the Death Sorer and it explodes, taking Preutzen with it, and it's awesome and badass. Sometime later, they go to a big ceremony uh, with Rudolph, and I, I totally did not recognize Irvine here without his headband and eye patch. While Vaughn is offered the Imperial Medal of Honor by Rudolph, we see that he and Fiona leave before the ceremony, determined to continue their journey to find the truth behind Zoid Eve. Zoid's Chaotic Century is a show that honestly really surprised me. I am happy that Zoid's takes on a darker tone as the story draws on. As Vaughn's journey stretches longer and longer, it becomes more serious, and he's forced to evolve and adapt to the situation. The show gets pretty serious about killing characters off, too, when uh, it wants to illustrate a point, which is something I appreciated, barring that whole a la Barone thing. Uh, generally speaking, I enjoyed all of the characters, including Irvine, Moonbay, and Fiona, but the secondary characters like Rob, Schwartz, and Kruger are pretty interesting as well. While the core story of finding the truth behind Zoid Eve is not solved in this show, I honestly can't wait to watch Zoid's Guardian Force to find out. Zoids absolutely has value as a show today, and while it is basically a plastic model commercial like pretty much every mecha property ever, the effort that was put into this story here is commendable. I can see why the anime propelled Zoids into a new realm of popularity. Hey everyone, welcome to today's end card. Let's start by thanking the channel members, aka Batosai, Brian Sanchez, D Mels, Daniel Johnson, Deader V, Dilla Soul 22, Gert, Joe Castellanos, Joe Cavazos, John Lamb, Johnny G, Canto 20, McLean Nugent, Mr. Smash, Zappa Slave, Video Gamer 75, Trey Hardy, Sindustries, Harmonious, Yo Yo Mitch, and Azure Windress. Thank you very much. I gotta put you guys back into alphabetical order because I keep forgetting. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this look at the first half of the Zoids anime. Uh, in a couple weeks, we're going to be looking at Zoids Guardian Force, so the other 33 episodes of the original Zoids show. So that'll be really, really, really fun. I really, I really liked this show a lot. Like... I don't, I, I did not expect it to be this good, uh, like I said a couple of times in the video, and as of recording this, I'm, I am watching, um, Guardian Force, and it's even better, like, the animation and action is pretty good. There's a couple times in my notes for Guardian Force I've written down, like, the animation for this episode is, like, actually impressive, which, you know, I mean... Chaotic Century looks fine, but there, there, it's not great. Like, there's no moments that really popped out to me as being, like, great animation. But it was all passable to good. But Guardian Force has some really good moments. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this. Over on the gaming channel, we have started uh, the 6th Gen Summer event. It's an event. I'm calling it an event because I'm self-important. And I sniff my own ass, so it's an event. Uh, we're, we're playing a bunch of 6th gen uh, video games over there. So I think right now, uh, what's currently going up on the channel is Pokemon Emerald, SSX Tricky, and Ratchet and & Clank. And then also I'm going to throw some Sly Cooper in there to continue that at some point. But yeah, uh, that's been cool and fun, and I hope that you go over there and check it out. Besides Zoid's Guardian Force, I'm going to be doing Armor Hunter Mellow Link. 
uh, within the next two weeks because that show was great. I'm in the process of writing the script right now. And then uh, next for Gundam Retrospective, probably early in July, we'll be doing Gundam Build Fighters Try. Uh, I did explain in the channel update, the Gundam Retrospective is chronological, so the 100 million people that keep yelling at me just to skip to IBO, there's your answer. Even after I said that, I have people are like, just do IBO now. I'm like, no, don't make me come to your house and watch IBO with you and give you the live review because I'll do it. I will do it 278 times for everybody that says that. So uh, anyway, uh, th this was fun. Um, I don't really have anything else to say besides like this video and subscribe. And if you don't do it, I'll know. And then I'll be, well, sad, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, I will see you guys soon. If you want to go over to the T, I'll just bleh bleh myself. If you want to go over to the gaming channel and sub there and uh, check that out. I talk a lot about the process of video making scrambled throughout those episodes. So if that interests you that that kind of talk goes on there. So I'm going to stop rambling now, let you get on with your day and uh, you all have a wonderful weekend.